This is Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. If you drive long haul, short haul, or heavy haul, they're here to empower and inspire women in the trades on TNCRadio.live. So gear down, sit back, and enjoy. Welcome to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy DeCaro. We're a show that works to inspire and empower women in trucking and the trades in every profession. We tackle all kinds of topics and work to encourage women to be their very best with informative guests and women who've been champions. I'm Shelley and I'm Kathy. No topic is not allowed on our rig. We tackle all kinds of topics and we like to feature experts and celebrities who can empower and inspire women. Have you ever wondered if someone's lying to you? Have you ever wished you could tell for sure so you aren't taken advantage of or blindsided in business, your career, or your personal life? Faith Hibbs Clark can detect when people are lying. She's made a career of it. She uses a proven science of how to read body language. Faith obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree in Justice Studies at Arizona State University, where she studied behavioral psychology and communications. She worked with trial attorneys, business executives, and politicians to assist in determining if a person was lying. Faith then went on to the film industry, where she now teaches famous actors how to be more believable when they lie on camera. She's been a casting director for over 20 years. Her communications method for actors, the acting science, is a unique acting method she created as a former deception detection body language expert. Faith has some very cool insight and an interesting background. We wanted to talk to her, so she's on the show with us today. We're excited. Welcome, Faith. Thank you for being with us. Hello. Yes, thank you for having me. You know, you've been quite the innovator and businesswoman, and you have a very unique talent that all of us would love to have. How did all this begin? I think it began when I was a child. Uh, Certain people have a natural ability to be able to perceive deception. And so when I was growing up, I grew up on a cottage farm, a small cottage farm in England. And as I was growing up, I was essentially an only child. I did have two older siblings, but they were much older than me. So I spent a lot of my my early years alone. And so I would observe adults talking and I would sort of listen in just for amusement's sake. And I would realize that there were aspects of their conversations that didn't add up to me. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know that at that time I was, even as a child, reading their body language. But later when I would hear these adults talking about, oh, yes, that person was lying, blah, blah, blah. I thought, how did I know that? How did I know that in advance? So I went through a small period of my time where I I thought uh, in my childhood that maybe I had psychic ability. My goodness, how was it possible that I knew these people were lying prior to me finding out that they were lying? But as I got older, I realized that this ability was less about mystical uh, psychic ability, although perhaps that is some of it. Perhaps psychics are in fact reading body language. But it was more to do with science. So when I got into the university environment, I was recruited by one of the professors whose task it was to find young up and coming deception detection uh, types of people. And he tested me. He said, you know, I think I I see something in you that I I, I recognize. And he tested me. He had me do this exam and I scored really, really high. I believe last time I checked one of the highest scores in the history of the university. Wow. And that was news to me. I had no idea that I was carrying around the skill. He then started introducing me to... Uh, various different super important people, so important I didn't even realize how important some of these people were. And he introduced me to these people. They they were politicians. They were um, high-profile trial attorneys. And he was essentially testing me out to see if I could actually act upon this, this skill that I had tested so high for. Turns out that that was, uh, it went over really, really well, that I was able to have great success working with these people. And he suggested to me that I go out on my own and start charging money for it. So I did just that. 
I started working with trial attorneys. I would do a lot of work with reading the juries, uh, not selecting the jury. I had no part of that, but I would advise the defense how you could make this argument based on the information that I had gathered by observing the jury and then helping them craft their, 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 their closing arguments. I worked with some federal agents and their, their investigations. And I also worked with some wonderful CEOs uh, that uh, in, in uh, reading, mostly merger meetings, they were very interested in seeing if the other person had more to give. So I would pretend to be an administrative as assistant, which back then we used to call a secretary. Mm -hmm. So I would pretend to be a secretary and I would do sign language essentially when the other party would talk and I felt that they were not being truthful, there, were, uh, there was body language, there was sign language that I had predetermined with my client that if, you know, if I put my hair over my shoulder, if I put my hands together, this means this. So I would read them and in real time, I'd be able to give them that information back of this is actually not true, back up. You know? So it was kind of like this, sign language for, for business people. That was very popular. Finally, my career landed me in the unique position of working with politicians. And this is where I got a little burned out, folks, <laughs> because <laughs> um, I was starting to work with politicians and politicians seemed to be very interested in learning how it was that I could tell when somebody was lying so that they could reverse engineer that process. And they, in fact, could then say whatever they wanted to without that lie being detected. How appropriate. Thus, the age-old question, how do you know when politicians are lying? When their lips are moving, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't heard that one before. That's what, I was going to say when they're dead, that's when you know they're not lying. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it, it basically, it was then that I realized that the reverse engineering aspect of deception detection is very vital. It's very important. But I didn't feel like that was right for me. You know, it was sort of a... a, a crisis of conscience in that and and this was all sides of the political fence this was not i i worked with some republicans democrats some independents i, I worked with the gamut so it wasn't it it wasn't that i worked with only you know this particular party and they were always trying to lie i think we have to sort of take a step back and realize that it is human nature to lie so when we want to say one party wants to say that, oh, all Democrats are liars, all Republicans are liars. You can't trust those independents. It, it's all human beings have a desire to lie. All human beings have a desire to lie. And the reason for that is that you know, a lot of anthropologists believe that we started to lie as human beings and around the same time that we created speech because we could see a resource and we could say it didn't exist. We could see something with our, our own eyes. You know, there's the, the wild buffalo over there, a food source. But we, if we say it's not there, then that creates a sense of doubt. So a, a lot of people, a lot of anthropologists in particular, believe that we created speech as a tool for deception and that we lie and want to lie to conserve valuable resources. I always say valuable resources like food, water, shelter, quality men. Mm -hmm. But a boom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The basic uh, so needs. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it, it, resources that we're running out of. Um, that's always the joke, of course. Uh, but the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we, we do like to lie. And I think that that's a very unpopular thing to say. But we lie for lots of different reasons. In my thesis work, I put together uh, 13 different types of lies, varying degrees of malintent. So there's a lot, of, a lot of ways in which we lie in a day, in an, in an average day, that we don't, that don't have necessarily a malintention, that we're not, we're not trying to hurt somebody or, or um, do it in some kind of evil way, right? But the average person, the average person lies 81 times per day. 
Whoa. in some fashion what? or another. Yeah. What? So, what? so if you're like, if you're sitting over there, Shelly, saying, "Well, that's not me. I'm mm-hmm. a, I'm a, good, I'm a good Christian lady. I, I would never do that. <laughs> not that you speak right? that way, but if, but uh-huh. if you know, when people protest, I say, well, there's your one. You got eighty more to go. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's that's a lot per day. It is. It is. Ooh. And it, it, it's curious how we get to that number. Uh, like I said, not all lies are malicious. For example, one of the ways that we know that someone is lying is that your body will show the truth before you speak. So the way the brain processes you are going to be, you know, we start in this, this place of homeostasis with everything is right in the world. Then a situation happens. We have a physiological reaction to, to that situation. It forms an emotion. The emotion then is channeled through our body and then we'll create body language. Then we have, and only then we have a thought and that thought we verbalize into into speech, or perhaps we have a thought and we don't speak that thought. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is that your body is going to show the truth before you can say anything. So if you say something that's not truthful, your body is going to give you a way. Your body is going to indicate to us, to anyone, you are not saying something that is congruent or truthful with what your body is also saying. So reading body language is reading the truth of that person Uh where it gets complicated is that people don't necessarily when i talk about these 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 lies uh, these 13 different types of lies these people don't necessarily know that they are lying themselves the self lies is a large portion of the types of lies that we tell in a day i'll work out later for example i I was going to ask you about that is it lying to other people or to ourselves okay We can definitely lie to other people and we definitely do. And sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. For example, another type of lie is what I call the future lie. Your brain treats anything in the future as unknown information. So it's therefore going to treat it as if it is not true. It's going to treat it like a contradiction because the brain, from the brain's perspective, well, this hasn't happened yet. We don't know if this is going to happen or not. So when you say to your significant other, oh, baby, I'll never cheat on you, you might want that to be true. Your brain, your brain is like, wait a minute, we haven't met everybody yet. We don't know if this <laughs> is going to be true or not. Right. Um, and so that's going to read in your body as a lie. That's called the future lie. Wow. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors. Coming up. Trucking Moves America Forward, or TMAF, is building a positive image of trucking by telling the story of the hardworking drivers and industry professionals who support the industry. And you can be a part of it. Learn more about TMAF and how you can join and be a part of the industry movement working to build a strong image of trucking by visiting TMAF's website at truckingmovesamerica.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our latest channel, TikTok. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. You have really researched all of this. Um, this is some fabulous insight. Now, you said there's always a tell. The body tells on you, essentially. What are the physical characteristics wouldn't it be an advantage to be able to see that? Because some people are really good liars. Yes, I've dated them all. <laughs> um, I've dated a few myself, personal experience. You betcha. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's when I got the uh, m- memory of an elephant. <laughs> you know? Exactly. For- because uh, lies uh, usually are forgotten. <laughs> so Most yeah. people will listen to someone's words. Our culture is so obsessed with words. We get these expressions, you have my word, my word is my honor. Um, We're really hyper-focused as a society on people's words. Well, he said he loved me. Mm -hmm. We go by what people say. 
as if somehow magically them saying it makes it true. What you have to do is you have to look at the body language because you can say anything. You can manipulate the truth in a day by saying anything you want. In fact, some people believe things just because they hear it and said enough times. Right. But if you want to know the truth, look at their body, look at their body language, read what they're really saying based on what their body is telling you. But we don't do that anymore. As a society, we've become very hyper-focused on what people say, and we don't take the time to look at what people are really saying. And they're saying that through their body. Their body speaks volumes. Their body is, is designed to speak the truth. So when in doubt, go with what their body is saying. Do you think children have an innate ability to tell if someone's lying? Because they really have to do a lot of reading of adults. A lot of that's to get their way. They want to get their way in something. And, and I mean, kids are really good manipulators, you know. Manipulators, dad, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, yes, you, yeah. You go to your mom and say, but dad said I could, and dad may not have said that, but, you know, <laughs> you know they're really good sales negotiators and everything. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I do think that I had that experience, like I said, at the top of the, the show, I had that experience as a child. I was very silent. I was very quiet as a child. So I, I spoke less and, and watched more. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, something that I was born with. And I think a lot of children are that way. They really pick up fast on the adults and the humans in their new environment. Of, of being on this earth. And so they, they, they pick up on things that even us as adults don't. This is why you have to be so careful with children because they can so easily be uh, emotionally wounded or, or uh, made to feel bad in some way that you as an adult wouldn't even begin to think about. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to be careful with, with how we are around young people. Some children... <laughs> Uh, I would say all children because we all, you know, start as children, right? So I, I would say that we learn at a, a fairly young age, you use the word manipulate, but that mm -hmm. is a form of lying, right? So we learn to manipulate our environment. And even mm -hmm. though I joked about it earlier with, you know, we lie to, to keep our valuable resources, we, we sort of come into this world with this innate sense of fear, that controls our, our mind for, for most, if not all of our life. And so children come into it not being in control of, of their own existence, depending on these adults, these human beings to, to give them their basic needs and perhaps their wants and desires. And so those are valuable resources that they might not get or have, therefore, they quickly learn that they have to manipulate their environment, which includes, unfortunately, the people in it. Mm -hmm. And that does not get better as adults. That only gets worse because you start to lie more as you get older. Interesting. I know that uh, coming from a, an abusive background, abusive childhood, um, lying was a form of self-preservation. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, that if, uh, you know, uh, the, the violence was ex would, would have been extremely worse had I told the truth or, you know, things like that. So learning to become truthful was a process for me um, based on how I'm perceiving who's in front of me. Right. And what the consequences of my actions would be. Right. So I never really learned to be 100 percent accurate and to be who I am today until I was like 40, <laughs> until I was in treatment where I actually had to unlearn all these ingrained behaviors since childhood. And then I had to refigure out who Kathy really was at the age of 40 and then kind of put it all together. You know, this is not me. This is not me. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is definitely me. <laughs> and then we kind of basically relearn how to be, you know, at this, in the second half of my life. And, and I got to tell you that um, when I look back at who I used to be and who I am today and all that I do um, with the people that I work with, um, 
I, I, I find it very liberating to be able to stand in my own truth and as difficult as it is, is to speak the truth <laughs> and to hold my grounds, to keep my boundaries. And even though it's going to make people uncomfortable and I don't feel the need to, to lie anymore to please people or to, to hide something that I, I'm not hiding anymore, right? So it completely shifted my whole um, sense of being and I, I really value myself for the woman that I've become over the last you know um, 13 years and who I am today I mean we're all a work in progress that's a given but I mean I wouldn't change anything in my journey to 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 who I am today and and the process is beautiful but I do in saying that I do really pay attention <laughs> because of who I was and because of my own journey, I pay attention to other people <laughs> and their body language and, mm -hmm. and their eyes, you know, because the eyes are the windows to the soul. Yeah. And so your information is actually really valuable to me to, to just to, to continue to assist me in all that I do. Thank you very much. Well, I think that, um, I think that your, your story is very, very compelling. I think that I can definitely relate to that in in so many ways and i think that there's probably a lot of people out there a lot of the listeners that can can relate to that uh, sadly those kind of abusive situations are far more common and pervasive than we wish mm -hmm. i yes. think um it's important to understand again that when i talk about how many lies the average person tells in a day and this you know sort of arbitrary number of 81 lies per day and again, it's it's really important to understand the different types of lies. So what you're describing is very much the survival lie that you you mm -hmm. lied to 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 stay alive. You, you lied yeah. to not get hurt. You lied to to navigate this this brutal and and painful environment that you had no choice but to be in. And mm -hmm. then when you did get to a place of safety, a place where you had a choice, you realized more than other people, perhaps the power of honesty, mm -hmm. because you being your authentic self, you being honest allows other people to navigate their world with honesty. When you lie to somebody, all you do is perpetuate that, that problem. And, and, and I call it, micro abuse because when you lie to someone it may not be physical abuse it may not be over emotional abuse or verbal abuse and perhaps you could even put it into the category of verbal abuse but by lying to someone you deny access you deny access to their truth their journey of discovery is impeded when someone lies to them so the most giving thing that you can do for another human being, despite whether or not they like the truth, and that's another conversation, right? Whether or not they like the truth, you giving them that truthful, honest information from your perspective allows them the opportunity to navigate that information in a truthful, honest way from their perspective. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. When, when you think about it, lying is, is really a violation. It, it is a mm -hmm. violation of trust. It really throws a monkey wrench in any kind of relationship. It's like, can I, where do we go from here? It, it, it's very problematic. And it's very sad that it, it goes on. And it's, it's a kind of an innate characteristic of being a human being as we've evolved. What are some of the characteristics, physical characteristics, the tells, if you will, that people can look for. Obviously, if they know the person, they can pretty much probably figure that out. But when you're encountering a stranger, say you go in to have your car work done, or in this case, maybe a, a, one of the owner operators with a big rig, they want to know if that mechanic's telling the truth so they don't get ripped off, that kind of thing. This is a big question because it's a big question because uh, there's a couple of things that we have to talk about first. And then I can give you some examples to, to give you Okay. Sort of a, a splattering, an idea of how what things that you can look out for. Um, but the, the first thing is you kind of touched on this because you said if it's someone that you know, 
Mm-hmm. And the reason that someone you know is so, that why that information is so important and why you can tell when someone you know and love is, is uh, lying is because we have what I call a baseline on that, that person. And that baseline, you know that for them, that is, is normal. So one of the easiest ways that we can tell when someone is lying is, and, and this of course is not 100% because you would really have to study their body language in totality and compare that to their baseline. But, but one example that I can give you is anytime that there is a deviation from normalcy. So you have to first baseline that person and figure out what is normal for them. So let's say you meet a trucker and it's really normal for him to be expressive with his hands. He's, his hands are waving all over the place or her hands are waving all over the place. And this is just how this trucker is. Mm-hmm. And then you ask him a question, did you such and such? And they answer the question and now their hands aren't moving at all. Ask another question, a question that you know their answer is true. So you would have to get creative based on the situation. Perhaps you ask them a question about, uh, uh, have you seen your kids lately? Or uh, how's your your wife with uh, blah, blah, blah. Something Mm -hmm. that you know the answer to, so you would know if it's true or not. Then if you see that they're waving their hands around wildly again, when they tell the truthful statement that you know is true, that's a tester. So then you can think, okay, but when I ask him about such and such, so now ask the same question again, but reword it slightly differently, just so it doesn't look like you're losing your own mind by asking the same question twice. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Ask them that same question in a slightly different way. Watch their body language again. If this typically expressive person with a lot of hand gestures and movement gets very still again, you probably have, and I say probably because you'd have to take in other considerations, but it's at least a red flag. It's a red flag for the fact that this person might be lying. And then you can determine from there, do I need to trust but verify? Do I need to look into this some more? Do I need to double check that they did such and such like they said they did? Mm -hmm. This can be a really wonderful tool. Deception detection can be a really wonderful tool for for safety purposes and not just paranoia. Oh, I want to know when somebody is lying to me. I think the other thing that we have to consider is why is someone lying to me? Um, As a deception detection expert, I always joke and say, this is why I'm single, but it does make it very difficult because it's a, it's a, a, a skill that I can't turn off. I can't nice. turn it off. So I'm able to observe in active real time, all of these different lies that people tell me. One of the things that I have to consider just to get through my day without losing my mind is why, why is this person lying to me? So often I will turn it around and I will say something to the effect of, well, let's talk about why you're feeling discomfort right now. Rather than address the lie, well, I think you're lying to me. Take the emotion that I'm reading of discomfort and say, why do you, why do you feel uncomfortable with me right now? And that's a way, it's a bridge for me to be able to then get down to the nitty gritty of why they chose to lie to me in the first place without actually addressing the thing that I think is the lie. So what if they get defensive when you ask that? Is that also a sign that they're lying? Or it can be. Mm-hmm. It can be. But defensiveness is often speech patterns. Um, you know, maybe they speed up. Again, we're looking for a deviation for what's normal for that person. If they normally speak slowly and now all of a sudden they're, they're getting rapid speech, uh, that could be an indicator But more importantly, you really want to look at the body language. Is what they're saying and their body language congruent in meaning, or is it incongruent in meaning? So, for example, if you ask somebody a question and they say yes, but they shake their head from right to left, this is a really basic one, but if they shake their head from right to left instead of up and down, which would be congruent with yes, then it's possible that what they're answering is, is not accurate. So you would want to perhaps ask the question a different way or um, 
address perhaps their uncertainty. Again, there's these different types of lies. So they may not a intend to be lying to you. They might have an emotion associated with that with that lie, or they may be doing something that you had talked about earlier, which is they might might be a defense mechanism. They might just be getting defensive. Uh, but it's true, but they're getting defensive. Maybe somebody has accused them in the past of lying, so they're getting defensive instead. What we want to look for is the incongruent nature, the deviation from normalcy, and we really want to look to the pattern of behavior as well, and what I call clusters. Clusters is when you see, I take three or more indicators that this person is lying, then I'm going to really dial into this is probably, statistically speaking, this is probably not truthful. Then you've got to really determine, do they know that they're not being truthful? So an awareness, do you know that you're lying to me about this? Are you aware that you're lying to me about this? And if the answer is yes, why? Why are you lying to me about this? So there's sort of this process that you have to go through before you can even get into this could mean this or this could mean this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors coming up. Industry movement Trucking Moves America Forward is telling the story of the industry. Our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of. And join us on social media. Learn more at TruckingMovesAmerica.com. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. Now, I have heard that a lot of times when people are lying, they'll look in a certain direction with their eyes and that sort of thing. Are those things you look for also? That is really, really tricky. (laughs) That is really tricky. And I think that among deception detection experts, there's definitely some debate that goes uh, against the looking up to the right and looking down to the right and and those types of, of things. That largely came out of a body of work the emotional freedom technique and it lacks a little it lacks a little in that you really have to consider more than just the action itself again going back to what i spoke of and it's easy i mean it was so popular that particular teaching was so popular for quite some time still is um, and i'm not anti uh, that that technique but i think that it's that and more so you would have to look at that person's background, their cultural background, you would have to baseline them. You would have to see what is normal for that person. And then you would have to consider some environmental influences as well. So the content, for example, sometimes we look down and to the right when we're trying to recall numbers, for example. So Mm -hmm. if your question involves numbers, It may not be that they're lying. It may be that they're trying to recall a number. And that has to do with, you know, the areas of the brain and such and such. So I would say that there's a lot of truth to those types of explanations, but you have to do it in totality. You have to take all things into consideration. I always joke and say that I can teach the average person deception detection, body language reading, enough to make them dangerous. In other words, I could teach you that when somebody does a particular body language aspect, that it could mean that they're lying. Automatically, most people will minus out the could or the might. And they they go to their, their spouse and they say, um, are you cheating on me? And their, their, their spouse, um, you know, puts their hand to their throat, which might might or could be an indicator that they're lying. Uh, and then the, the, the spouse is like, you're lying. I knew you were lying. But you can't, it, it isn't that simple. Again, mm-hmm. number one, we want to look at their, their baseline and the deviation from what's normal for them. Um, maybe their throat hurt at that particular moment. So there could be environmental factors. There could be cultural factors. There's the baseline. And then in fact, 
you have to look for those clusters. Are we seeing lots of things that indicate deception? Are those things incongruent with what they're saying? Double negatives are, uh, gets really fun. Remember double negatives? That gets really fun yeah. when you're trying to read body language because now it could be that they are telling the truth when you have a double negative in your speech. So when you're dating, meeting somebody new. Yeah, I don't. Say... <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I'm retired. I'm retired. Oh, but go on, go on. <laughs> but when you meet somebody you don't know real well, how do you uh, be, how are you able to find their baseline quickly so that you can tell that they're not being truthful? You usually know something accurate about them, even even in, say, like a blind date situation. Perhaps you've met somebody online and you're meeting them for the first time. You probably have a little bit of information about, about that person. So start the conversation with what you know about that person already. Maybe they've already shared with you what they do for a living, for example, or some mm-hmm. aspect of what they do for a living. Oh, I work in the transportation industry. I, I drive a, a mammoth truck that can hold lots of Canadian hockey pucks <laughs> and you, you, you know this right you know this going in so get them talking about that first because you know that information to be true this is where you baseline this is where you watch the behavior you already know the information so you're not missing anything that they're saying because you already knew the information but you can watch them and see what they tend to do. Do they tend to lick their lips when they talk about their big rig? You know, that might just be an indicator of how they feel towards their big rig. Whereas licking your lips can be an indicator of some forms of deception if, if it's not their normal behavior. So ask about something you know, then immediately go to a conversation that might be more difficult quickly you have to determine what that question might be. But the more difficult of a question, the one you really want to know the truth about, do it immediately, ask that question or bring that conversation up immediately after the, the conversation that you know you can baseline. Then observe the difference. Is there a difference? So your first question would be, do they behave the same way about this subject as they do on this subject? So for example, and I'm not making any judgment calls here. I think that I think dating is like a um, a minefield. <laughs> it's it's a matter a of time before you step on one, right? Oh my, yes. I can really make it to the other side without blowing yourself up, but you're walking <laughs> through a minefield, folks. There's uh-huh. a good chance you're going to lose a limb. Uh, so anyway, not putting any judgments on those subjects. Perhaps you start talking about their occupation, get them talking about that observe their behavior, then perhaps the difficult question is, you, you, you mentioned that you're recently divorced, uh, and then start asking them about that, if that is perhaps a pre-qualifier for you for continuing the relationship, then observe the patterns of behavior in the first yet safe question, and how does that compare to the body language in the second and perhaps not so safe question? Mm-hmm. Then, if you are uh, verse, well versed in body language, you can not only look for the deception. And I think that I think that you know that was the field that I went into. That is the area that I specialize in. But one of the, the things that I think we forget when reading body language is that all deception is also tied to emotion. So when we lie, we have an emotional reason why we lie. Um, And so that emotion is just as important as the lie itself. So being able to detect that someone is lying is, is only one part of the puzzle. The other part of the puzzle is why they lied and the emotion that is connected to that. So perhaps you're reading their body language in that not so safe question. And you think that you are perceiving a cluster of body language that might indicate that they are lying. For example, they tell the story, you know, I'm going to use really cliche ones here, but let's say they tell the story with their palms down, pointed down. Uh, They're shaking their head no when they want to say yes. Um, A one-sided shoulder shrug or perhaps a um, a snarl in their upper lip. Um, Maybe they're folding their arms and covering up their, their, their body in a protective sense. 
okay, so we look at those things and we say, okay, we got a cluster now. Hey folks, we got a cluster, cluster alert. But what is the overwhelming key emotion that we observe? So if we go to self-soothing body language, self-soothing body language is the category of body language where, you know, maybe you rub your arm. That's a self-soothing gesture. And then we also notice that they're um, stroking their hair a bit, also a self-soothing gesture. So you start to notice that this cluster of lies all tend to fall into the category of self-soothing. That tells you that they feel very wounded by what they feel they have to lie about. So if you're asking the question, you're in the, you, I noticed that you were recently divorced, uh, do you want to talk to, about that? Is there anything about that you think that we should know as we start off our relationship? Uh, if you see a lot of self-soothing type indicators that could indicate that they are lying, for instance, oh yeah, my, my ex and I, were, we get along better than ever. Yes, she's dead, right? Isn't that what you said? Um, you tend to get along really well with people who are dead. <laughs> So, <laughs> so you start to see that there's a bigger issue there and that is that they they feel perhaps guilt they feel um betrayal anything that they might have to self-soothe with uh, another another example of these clusters that could fall into larger categories would be guarded behavior they just don't trust you enough to be honest with you. So if you start seeing things like crossing of the arms, the hand over their throat, that's a very guarded, or hand over their mouth, these are all, or pulling back physically in their body, these are all guarded behaviors associated with body language. In this case, this would, number one, tell you, you should probably back off of this subject for now because they're not feeling comfortable at talking to you. So mm -hmm. you may be putting them into a position where you're forcing them to lie to you. You know, good, good manners says we have to answer questions when asked. That's not necessarily true, but we tend to follow that anyway, particularly in sort of judgment environments like a first date or an audition. <laughs> uh, we, tend to, we tend to answer questions in judgment environments. We feel compelled to do that. That would indicate to you if there's a lot of guarded body language, it would indicate to you that this person's lying to you because you are stepping on territory that they're not comfortable with, that you've kind of overstepped your boundary. Perhaps now is not the time to have this conversation. So, so all of this said, there's a lot more to it than just are they lying, are they not lying, did they do something that indicates a lie? there's a lot more that you have to look at. And I think that when one of the things I really love about body language is it's sort of a, an equalizer. Once, once you are truly honest and lay your cards out on the table, when you no longer feel like you have to deceive to preserve limited resources, it's very freeing. It's very freeing. It's, it's an equalizer. Mm -hmm. And with that freedom comes empathy. If someone lies to you and you recognize that it's a lie and you recognize that you've stepped on ground that you shouldn't be stepping on just yet, that they're not, they don't feel safe with you yet, they don't feel open enough to tell you the truth yet, you can look at that emotion, that guarded emotion. Perhaps you then uh, dial down deeper and see that it's coming from a place of guilt. You then can be more empathetic and speak to that and, and adjust your communication style so that you're not stepping into uncharted territory that makes them feel unsafe, that conjures up their memories of guilt, that you can back off a bit. You, you can you can be more empathetic towards those people. So it's not all, always about going out there and, oh, you're busted. I can yeah, tell that you, right. you didn't do it. You didn't do it. You said you did it, but you didn't do it. I got you now. Because I saw you, I heard this, I was listening to this transportation podcast and they said, whenever you do such and such, you that means you're lying. I got you. Right, right. It's not all about that. It's, a, it's about learning to communicate more effectively and just generally speaking, being more empathetic as human beings. That's really how we level the power field. I think as Amen. a strong, powerful 
human being uh, who happens to also be a woman and identifies as a woman, even even as that, I, I hear so many times people saying, I want to learn this because I want to have the upper hand. I want to I want to be in the position of power. I think true power comes when you surrender needing to be in a position of power. I like that. True power yeah. comes from empathy. Mm-hmm. Which our society lacks, unfortunately. It does indeed. At, yes. at present, it does indeed. Yeah. You know, Faith, we have a lot of different listeners, and uh, not just in, in the trucking industry. And I know that uh, we actually have people who would like to be in the performance industry as well. And, you, of course, you have the communication method for actors. Can anyone reach out to you to get some of this training? Um, I can see that it would be a beneficial not only for acting, but maybe for sales, things like that, too. Um, and this is just tremendous knowledge. Thank you. And absolutely. I, I started off in a more generic sense, like I said, I started working with politicians. I still work with politicians from time to time. I will get a call from a politician. I just put them through a really long screening process. (laughs) Just just for my mental health, right? I put them through a really long screening process. I do, I still get the, the, the grapevine out there is still alive and well. I still get those calls. And I tend to put an end date on the, my involvement with them, but I still work with, with politicians. But when I stopped working with politicians uh, at that point in my career, I wanted to niche down into something that I thought was a better use of, of my particular skill set. And that, because I liked the, the authenticity and the genuineness that you can create through reverse engineering this body language practice in some of the ways in which I just explained, you know, how you can use it in navigating your, your communication and your conversations mm-hmm. for greater empathy. Yeah. That I realized that a profession that does that for a living is the actor. The actor lies for a living. It's what I call the entertainment lie. So sometimes we lie just mm-hmm. to entertain another human being. The difference between it being an entertainment lie and just being another type of lie is the entertainment lie is actually the only type of lie that I research that gives the other person is giving their consent to being lied to. So in exchange for being entertained, I'm going to consent that you're going to lie to me for the purposes of entertainment. I know it's a lie, but the trade-off is it's going to be really believable. Mm-hmm. So that when Brad Pitt is, is uh, you know, telling Angelie Jolie how much he, he loves her, we want to be able to vicariously put ourselves into the, the position of whoever we identify in that relationship. Uh, we want to be able to put ourselves in there. We do that with consent. Other types of lies, the person that's being lied to is not consenting. So this idea that you lie, you entertain, but you have to be believable is a perfect match for the actor because the actor's job is to be believable, especially in film and television, to be so believable that the the, the observer of this entertainment lie can suspend their disbelief long enough to place themselves vicariously in the role of the other person or Mm -hmm. in the environment perhaps in this story long enough to believe the entertainment lie and to be entertained. And that is actually really, really vital to all of us because we have to be entertained. We have to we have, to have a deviation from what is normal for, for our brains, keeping in mind that our brain is only designed to do two things very effectively. And one of them you kind of talked about earlier there when you were talking about your abuse of childhood and your survival one of the things that we absolutely are hardwired to do is survive. Yep. The other thing that I think you got to do now that you're in your forties is you get to evolve. Your brain is mm-hmm. designed to do those two things, survive and evolve. And once you move past survival, you get to truly flourish and evolve into the human being that you are meant to be. So it was a perfect fit for actors because what I bring to the table are scientifically based formulas, patterns of behavior that are reverse engineered from body language and deception detection. If you follow these formulas in your own unique way, it will lead to these outcomes, these determinations. Because the bottom line is everyone in this world is a body language expert. 
This is why when you meet somebody and you right away don't like them, it isn't something that they said. You got a gut instinct. It's actually your brain yep. reading body language and saying, you know, in, in this storage of, that you have in your brain of body language, not only from your own life experiences, but also from your ancestors' life experiences, that is deeply wired into your DNA that makes you say, I don't know what it was about them. Truth is, you do know what it is about them that you don't like. You just aren't consciously aware of it. So yeah. everybody is a body language expert at a subconscious level. The problem yeah. is we don't trust that. Often right, the gut enough. instinct. That's <laughs> where I've always gotten in trouble. <laughs> yeah, trust well, you your trust gut. your yeah. gut. Yeah. It's really trusting your subconscious brain, although the brain gut connection is 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 very, very evident. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question further, so I do work with actors. I work for, with actors from celebrity actors who are well established. I worked with Emma Stone, um, but also actors that are just starting out that mm -hmm. want to start into the acting career on the right foot because I always teach this. It's, it's one of the fundamental tenets of my, my communication method for actors. I'm not going to teach you how to act. I'm going to teach you how to lie. You do that entertainment lie on screen and you're believable in that entertainment lie. That's the reverse engineer thing that the politicians wanted me to teach them to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel good about doing. Then yeah. you're going to be believable. You're going to book more and you're going to be better perceived by the audience that watch your performances that can be done for any industry sure it can. any field so i do absolutely even though i niche down into working with actors i still very much usually from from word of mouth but very much work with other industries as well because we're all humans mm -hmm. <laughs> we all mm -hmm. need to communicate at a more effective level absolutely where do people find you my website is actingscience.com, actingscience.com. Another good place to follow me is on Instagram. I put a lot of little tidbits and, and whatnot on Instagram sort of as teasers to get actors and other people thinking about body language and the importance of our visual communication. They can find me on Instagram as well. That Instagram address is communication method for spelled out actors, communication method for actors. I love your insight. Uh, we could talk to you for another hour, but we don't have another hour. This is terrific, Faith. I could see us um, bringing you back and asking specific questions that we get from listeners. Uh, I would love that. Thank you. you. And I think people really feel a lot of deception today. So this mm. is very, very important for people to have knowledge of. And um, like you said, more empathy. Our world could use it. And, you know, keep in mind that deception is the opposite of evolution. Deception is associated with the survival portion of our brain. Yep. Truth is associated with the evolutionary aspect of our brain. And remember, the brain only does those two things. So when you hear things like in the Bible, when it says the truth shall set you free, mm -hmm. it really is neuroscience. Yeah. That portion of your brain is activated suppressing then the portion of your brain that is just built to survive, then we can truly evolve into a more honest and caring and empathetic society. I love this. Thank you so much for being what on. What a great podcast. show. Thank you so much. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. If you want to be a guest on the show, or have a topic or feedback, email us at info at tncradio.live. Thank you for listening to another great interview on tncradio.live. And don't forget, be sure to subscribe to our podcast of Women Road Warriors. It's free. All of the material you hear on tncradio.live on our website, our broadcasts, or our podcasts are copyrighted. There can be no distribution without the express consent of tncradio.live and its partners. For inquiries, write us at info at tncradio.live.